right. It's time to talk a little bit about how I think we should think about the inclusion of transgender athletes in competitive sport. First, a little bit about who I am, my background, and why this is a topic that I care a lot about, um, but also why it's a topic I know a few things about. So first, um, I'm a philosophy professor, I have a PhD, um, I'm affiliated with our Women's and Gender Studies program, I teach courses in trans studies, but I also teach courses in business ethics and sports ethics. So the issue of what is fairness in competitive sport is a topic that I both teach about but also research on. Personally, though, I'm also a competitive athlete. I've been a competitive athlete my entire life. It started around age three with golf. In fact, my first career path was something like professional golf until a car accident when I was 16, unfortunately. Um, I also played competitive national level badminton when I was still in Canada. So those are my main two competitive sports, but I also play baseball, rugby, tennis, squash, climbing, mountaineering, all kinds of sports. Currently, I am an elite international level competitive cyclist. In fact, I am a two-time state champion here in South Carolina. Um, I run an international cycling team named Foxy Moxie Racing. I'm also the elite team captain. So I'm not only an academic who can talk about sports and issues of fairness in sport, but I'm also an elite competitive athlete myself. In fact, in a few days, I have a whole week of pro racing to do. Also, I happen to be a trans woman myself and thus a trans athlete. So the issue of is it fair for trans athletes to compete in sport is both an academic issue for me, but also deeply, deeply personal. So it's a thing that I think about quite a lot. And I want to share some thoughts with you about how I think we should think about this issue. So some of my thoughts are, you know, what should we think about this issue? But what I want to focus on here is more how we should think about this issue. So let's get started. First, it's important to understand the ethical frameworks within sport operates. Mostly we are focused on things like the International Olympic Committee and the Olympic Charter. So the Olympic Charter has some principles of Olympism. Here they are. There are seven of them. The ones that matter most for us are number four and six. Four says the practice of sport is a human right. Every individual must have the possibility of practicing sport without discrimination of any kind and in the Olympic spirit, which requires mutual understanding with a spirit of friendship, solidarity, and fair play. Number six says, the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in this Olympic Charter shall be secured without discrimination of any kind, such as race, color, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. There are two important things to notice here. The first is that the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, recognizes sport and the participation in competitive sport as a basic human right. That's going to matter in a little bit. The second part here is the language of the sixth principle is consistent with the way that we often think about human rights protections from discrimination in that when we list a variety of conditions or protected statuses, such as race, sex, sexual orientation, and so on, it's important to include and to note the inclusion of or other status. This is not an exclusive list. This means that just because something like gender identity or transgender status isn't explicitly listed, it is still covered by this principle. So, Discrimination is inappropriate 
even by the language of the principles of Olympism. Later, we're going to talk about how discrimination can be justified, but the important point is to recognize that unless this high level of justification for discrimination can be met, it's inappropriate to exclude different types of people, including transgender people from competitive sport. The second thing to talk about is the evolution of the IOC's policy on transgender participation in sport. In 2003, the so-called Stockholm Consensus included a set of criteria for the participation of trans athletes. Specifically for transgender women, it required genital surgery, gonadectomy, as well as two years of hormone therapy. That has changed recently in the 2015 meeting of the IOC, named the IOC Consensus Meeting on Sex Reassignment and Hyperandrogenism, they changed their policy to remove the surgery component. Trans women no longer are required to have an invasive, expensive, painful surgery that many people don't even want, and instead of a requirement of two years of hormone therapy, the regulation requires that an athlete be able to demonstrate that her total testosterone and serum has been below 10 nanomoles per liter for at least 12 months prior to her first competition, and that she may be monitored, but not necessarily, uh, to see that her testosterone levels remain below that limit. Now, where did that limit come from? Well, it was chosen as five standard deviations away from the average female testosterone level. Women all have testosterone and make endogenous testosterone. It was also selected as the bottom of the average male range. So the policy has evolved over time. One of the issues though is, is this a fair policy, right? This is a thing that we can ask. What are the legal and ethical foundations for answering such a question? That's what I want to focus on here. One of the first things to think about in answering the question about how to think about trans athletes in sport is who has the legal authority for making these decisions? For the IOC, when we have policy disputes, we turn to what's known as the Court for the Arbitration of Sport, which has its headquarters in Lausanne, Switzerland. The Court for the Arbitration of Sport, or CAS, is an arbitration court, not a criminal court. And while they are not strictly bound by uh, setting precedent, they tend to uh, make subsequent decisions in line with previous decisions. One of the most important recent decisions was their interim decision in 2014 for the sprinter or the runner duty chand. And this addressed the issue of the IAAF's hyperandrogenism regulations policy, which was argued to be discriminatory against intersex as well as transgender athletes. A few things that happened in that decision are important for how we should think about trans athletes in sport. First, the Court for Arbitration of Sport recognizes that in almost all sports, we have two categories for gender-segregated sport, male or men, and female or women. Second, CAS recognizes in the principles of Olympism that participation in sport is a human right. Third, CAS ruled that they, and by the extension the IOC, are no longer in what they call the sex verification business. That is, they no longer set a criteria to determine whether or not an athlete is of a particular sex. In its place, they've decided to go with the athlete's legally recognized gender. So if, for example, a trans woman has legal recognition in her country of citizenship as a woman, her passport, driver's license, birth certificate, all these say F on it, then for the purposes of sport, she's female. One important thing here is that in some jurisdictions, particularly Canada, where I'm from, 
you can have your birth certificate changed for your transitioned sex without genital surgery and strictly speaking without hormone therapy provided that you can have documentation from medical professionals, uh, maybe a psychologist with a PhD, that your gender transition is genuine, you can have all your documentation changed. So this presents something interesting for CAS and other sports organizations that participate in international sport, because some jurisdictions are more liberal in their recognition of athletes' real gender. So as far as CAS and the IOC are concerned, trans women are legally recognized women, trans men are legally recognized men. Trans women are women, trans men are men. The issue that CAS had to decide was not whether any particular athlete, whether they're intersex or trans, is a woman or a man, but assuming that they are a legally recognized woman, are they a woman eligible for competition? So the decision was not between whether an athlete is of a particular sex, but whether they are eligible as that member of a sex. Another important feature is in the Duty Chand interim decision, the Court for the Arbitration of Sport decided that the testosterone cap of 10 nanomoles per liter constituted a concept that we refer to as prima facie discrimination, particularly prima facie discrimination on the basis of a natural physical trait, namely endogenous, internally produced testosterone. Prima facie discrimination is discrimination. The issue in a case of prima facie discrimination is whether or not that discrimination can be ultimately justified. So what we mean by prima facie is that at first look, before we do any investigating in terms of justification, is this discrimination, is it discrimination on the basis of a natural physical trait? And Kaz said, well, putting a cap on natural endogenous testosterone for some athletes is prima facie discrimination on the basis of a natural physical trait. So how do we think about trying to go about justifying prima facie discrimination. In international human rights law, there are three requirements to justify prima facie discrimination. The first is that the discrimination has to be judged to be in service of a worthy goal. In this case, the hyperandrogenism regulations are in service of the goal of fairness in sport. That's usually judged to be a pretty worthy goal. So it passes the first test. The second test is, is this discrimination necessary and effective for securing that goal? Now things get tougher. We'll get into that in a little bit. Third, is the harm caused by the discrimination proportionate to the benefit gained by securing the goal? Namely, is the harm caused to the people discriminated against proportional to the benefit gained by discriminating against them. That's also kind of tough. So as I noted, the prima facie discrimination was rightly, in my opinion, judged to be in service of a worthy goal, fairness in sport. But now we have to ask, what is fairness in sport? This is a big topic. In fact, I'm teaching an entire course on just this question. Some people think that fairness in sport is what we would refer to as a level playing field. That is, every athlete has an equal opportunity to succeed. But this isn't how sport works. Sport is all about not having a level playing field. We train harder than our competitors. We try to be more intelligent, have better skills, have better tactics, better coaching, better nutrition better recovery than our competitors. Sport is all about unleveling the playing field. So a level playing field can't be what we mean by fairness in sport. In fact, consider two athletes. One is 5'3", another is 6'4". Both of these are women. Now, in general, the short woman will have a large competitive advantage over the tall woman in sports that select for small bodies. Sports like gymnastics, figure skating, and distance running. 
tend to select for smaller bodies. However, the tall woman will have an unfair competitive advantage in sports that select for height, such as volleyball and basketball. But is it unfair? Certainly, it's a large competitive advantage. In fact, for sports that select for height, the short woman will not be able to compete at an elite level. But we consider that to be fair, even though the playing field is obviously unlevel. So we have to recognize that bodies come in different shapes and sizes. And it's important to note, though, in thinking about sex, that the difference on average between sexes is much smaller than the difference within a sex. So the average height difference between men and women, for example, is relatively small compared to the difference between the shortest woman and the tallest woman. Bodies come in all shapes and sizes, Sports select for people of different types of bodies, and we consider this fair even though the playing field is, strictly speaking, unlevel. So fairness in competition can't mean level playing field. At most, it means fair enough competition. And then the tricky part is determining how much advantage we're going to permit. In the duty chant case, the issue was higher than average levels of endogenous testosterone. Now, all parties in the case granted that, in general, men have a 10 to 12% advantage in sports compared to women. The IAAF's position is that this is primarily due to, on average, a 10 times higher level of endogenous testosterone. Most women have between 0.5 and 3 nanomoles per liter, whereas men have over 10 nanomoles per liter. It's important to note, though, that some men even elite athletes, are in the normal female range. Some women are also above the normal female range. Some women are even into what we would call the normal male range. So the range of levels of endogenous testosterone are all over the place. The question was, does a woman with higher than average endogenous testosterone enjoy a large competitive advantage over other women? The assumption, remember, was that the higher your testosterone, the more like the men's competitive advantage you would have on the range of 10 to 12%. Unfortunately for the IAAF, by their own best data, which wasn't very good by the way, is that hyperandrogenic women, so women with higher than average testosterone, had a 2 to 3% competitive advantage. It's not very much. Also, remember back to our two very tall athletes. The tall athlete has far more than a 10 to 12% advantage over the short athlete in sports that select for height. So the 10 to 12% number based on the average difference between male and female athletes being 10 to 12% is a little bit arbitrary. So on the question of is the discrimination on the basis of a natural physical trait necessary and effective for securing the goal of fairness in sport. And if we're talking about a 2 to 3% competitive advantage, the answer has to be no. We permit much larger competitive advantages with issues such as height than we do for something like endogenous testosterone. So the policy is not necessary for securing our goal of fairness in sport. Since we permit higher degrees of competitive advantage based on other natural physical traits, we can't single out endogenous testosterone in this way. Finally, the third condition for justifying prima facie discrimination is that the discrimination is deemed to be uh, proportionate. So the harm that's caused to the discriminated athletes is proportionate to the gain that we get from discriminating against them. And here, we have to recognize that intersex and transgender athletes are some of the most marginalized people that we have in our society. So the harm that we visit upon an already marginalized group for the sake of fairness in sport isn't likely to pass this test. It doesn't seem proportionate. If sport is a human right, and we're talking about further discriminating against an already heavily marginalized group in our society, I, in my personal 
professional opinion, don't think that it's going to meet the proportionality requirement. So this is just a little crash course in how we should think about whether excluding transgender women from sport passes the test for prima facie discrimination. I think it doesn't. Trans women are legally recognized women, and excluding them from sport is neither necessary or efficient, nor does it pass a proportionality test. In future videos, I'm going to go into more detail about the science and the physiology of trans athletes.